Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. Welcome to GP Strategies uh, Learning Unplugged series. This is where we ask guest panelists to join us to talk about hot topics in learning. And um, I'm really, really excited for today's session. And as we get started, I'd just like to make sure everybody can find that chat function, because if you want to ask questions, if you want to get involved, please do use the chat. So up on your screen are instructions right now. Please do make sure that you're uh, messaging to everyone. Uh, don't just send to me as the host or to one of the panelists. Please do message to everyone so everyone can see your questions in the chat. So please do keep that in mind as we move forwards today. So without further ado, let's talk about um, who's with me today. So I'm very fortunate to be um, joined by Lily Joe and Anthony Ward Rushton. And I'd love to just give them a quick introduction before they say hi. So you have an idea of who's with us today. So my name is Oliver. I'm the uh, client engagement director for GP Strategies based out of Singapore. And um, I've been in APAC for the last 15 years, 10 years in China and five years in Singapore. And I'm joined today by Lily. Now, Lily has over 16 years of experience in the field of learning and development, um, OD, and also talent management. And she's worked for companies like Microsoft and UL and currently Cargill. And she's really focused on partnering um, with the business to achieve transformation through culture, strategic talent programs, and learning. And she's really interested in integrating um, her personal roles of a consultant, a coach, a facilitator, to really help her achieve her purpose, which is to ignite individual and organizational potential so that individuals and companies can reach their full potential with love and power. And she's currently the global talent partner and APAC L&D consultant at Cargill. And she's based in Shanghai, China. So do you want to say hi, Lily? Hi, everyone. Yeah, Lily here calling from Shanghai. Good morning and good afternoon too. For some of you, maybe join from like Australia. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much, Lily. And um, we're also joined by Anthony Ward Rushton. And Anthony has, and I didn't believe this when I read this, Anthony, over 35 years of banking experience with HSBC. <laughs> um, you have aged much better than me, my friend. <laughs> um, and so for the first 15 years of that career, you undertook a wide variety of senior frontline roles within corporate and retail banking. But for the last 20 years, Anthony specialized in learning and development. And um, his first learning role was back in London, where he was a part of the HSBC group learning team responsible for international leadership interventions. And during this period, he worked on lots of different strategic global projects, which has given him an excellent and in-depth understanding of different businesses in numerous countries. Then in 2003, he was seconded to Hong Kong and joined the Asia Pacific Regional Learning Team. And he's presently regional head of learning for Asia Pacific and responsible for leading regional region wide learning design and delivery across. And I think I'm reading this right. 19 geographies. Anthony, you're a busy, busy man. <laughs> Yes, exactly. I mean, 19 countries. I mean, all, all the Asia countries, starting from kind of India, Bangladesh, etc., sweeping right down to Australia, New Zealand. So quite a large geographical area. And I've got to admit, I, I still don't believe it's 35 <laughs> years in the bank. I, I'm not going to believe that one. That's a typo, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you both for joining me today. And I'm really excited to dive into some of the questions, um, the topics that we want to talk about. But before we do that, what I'd love to do is just set the scene for everybody who's joining us today as to really why are we having this discussion and what's it all about. So we've been talking a lot with our clients and um, our 
our network in the industry of learning and development and the, the hot topic is global disruptions. Now, there's an elephant in the room, uh, which is obviously COVID and as different countries are coming out of various COVID restrictions at various different paces and constantly changing environments, that is obviously front of mind. But I just wanted to highlight a couple of major global disruptors that we are looking at and we're expecting over the coming years. So. The first bullet here, by 2030, it's expected that 50% of knowledge workers will see at least half of their activities automated. And that may be through the advent of artificial intelligence, through robotic process automation. There's lots of things coming in that are um, automating those roles. And whole industries are really being disrupted by new technologies. And we've seen this in the past, and this is only going to accelerate in future. And what we're expecting is that, and what we're seeing on the ground is that new skills and job roles are really replacing those that are being lost. So we're not in need of less workers, we're just in need of different skills and roles. And the demand for those emerging skills will really outstrip supply by an estimated four to one, according to uh, McKinsey Consulting. So there's going to be this talent shortage and this, this fight for talent if we're just always looking externally to bring in these skills. So just before I get started with diving into this juicy topic with the panel, what I'd love everybody to do who's um, joining us today is dive into the chat. I can see lots of people have been messaging that they're calling in from Singapore. We've got folks from Shanghai, um, a, a real diverse group joining us today. But what I'd like you to do is just drop into the chat. What are the major disruptions that you guys are seeing in your industries? What are the things that are keeping your strategic planners up at night? And uh, what are the things are you seeing over the horizon? You know, is it COVID or are there other disruptors hitting your industry that folks who aren't in your industry might not even be aware of? Um, you know, we talk about automation coming to get banking and finance, but automation has already had a massive impact on the automotive uh, industry and on manufacturing. So sometimes we learn a lot from other industries. So please do drop that in the chat. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And with that, Zach, if I can ask us, uh, let's take away the slides for now so that we can see uh, Lily and Anthony's faces. Um, and then we'll, we'll dive in to really getting into our questions. So I'd like to start um, with you, Anthony, if I may. Uh, obviously, banking is, I think, the the kind of the, the phrase going around is it's the most disrupted industry maybe in the world right now. So what are the major disruptions that you're seeing um, in the banking and finance industry right now? It is definitely what you've alluded to in, in, in terms of the technology and the pace of that introduction of technology as well. Um, but, but also what I am noticing as well is I look over kind of the last 10, 15 years, um, with, with the majority of roles within banking, um, use the expression, there's a lot of general bankers, very good, solid, professional at what they do. But these days, it's actually becoming that they've got to be specialists in specialist role because of the, the technology piece. And with that, they need deep subject matter expertise. So I think once you actually start uh, your career within a bank now, you've, you've more or less quickly got to, got to kind of make a decision of what are the areas that you really want to specialize in in order that you do become that subject matter expertise. Excellent. Thank you so much, Anthony, for sharing that. And um, we're, we're also seeing some messages from the chat as well. So um, uh, Eugene Lee says a lack of IT skill sets in some countries in APAC. So maybe an inability to adapt rapidly to this technological change. So thank you very much for sharing that. And, um, and I have another one from Kai, which is um, the inability to be agile. So the, or the, sorry, the need to be agile in our in uh, our skill sets, absolutely. So uh, I'd like to pass this question over to you, Lily. Within Cargill, I mean, obviously a di diff very different industry from banking and finance. Yeah, what are yeah. you seeing as big disruptors that are coming in to impact your business? 
Okay. So I think uh, for uh, maybe a little bit introduction about who Kaggle is before we enter into these disruptions, because um, um, Kaggle is not a, a company who is good at like a branding. So, uh, so we are working in the pharma, uh, like a, 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 a agriculture industry. So you, if five years ago, uh, people, uh, you will see a lot of like IT, uh, like transformations. So people always will say like agriculture industry is always the most stable one. But nowadays, it's no longer the story because in agriculture, you will see also we are serving a lot of like a, uh, like a B2B businesses, like for our cotton business, McDonald's is our client, for food ingredients, Pepsi is, uh, or uh, no, not Pepsi, Coca-Cola is our uh, client. So uh, also we are serving these like big companies, but their end customers is the consumers on the market. So these people, if you, you can imagine, we all like buying food in the supermarkets every day. So we are looking forward to have like more healthy food and more uh, like a low fat or low oil like a food. And even some vegetarians, they want it to be more healthy food kind of thing. So these all uh, like uh, expectations are disrupted our industry to see like how to enable and empower our uh, business um, customers to uh, like serve their clients in a more agile, in a more innovative way. So uh, accordingly, internally, we also need to this kind of like uh, transformation um, of our capabilities as well. Thanks so much, Lily. So, you know, I think the, the, the commonality there is at the end of the day, yes, disruptors are happening in both industries and, and the impact on people is really key. And Georgina has added, um, you know, disruptor into the chat here. Uh, Georgina has said that for, for her, the, the big disruptor is the great resignation and a war on talent. People are making career changes away from consulting to in-house tech companies or startups. A change in how people want to work and challenge on how quickly we can respond and maintain our services to our clients and grow. So I really appreciate you sharing these. And, and I guess I'd, I'd like to go back to Anthony and, and just kind of tie this back to um, this idea of future skilling or reskilling or upskilling and working with the employees that we have in an organization. Um, and, and why that is, is so important to, to HSBC. Yeah, and we, we've taken a very, very structured approach to this. Um, and th this, this quite large transformation has been happening over the last uh, 18 months, 24 months. Um, so in our structured approach, I mean, in basically we, 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 we came up with four pillars. Uh, the first pillar is going right back to basics and really changing fundamentally on how we actually provide training in all topics. And what we consciously made the decision on is really for individuals to absolutely get proactive of their own development. Again, years ago, it was very much a case of top down, that those were the list of programs that your line manager used to send you on. Now we've literally completely reversed it and put people in charge of their own development and got them to be absolutely curious on uh, going on our HSBC University site where all the programs and training solutions are and really proactively be curious about their careers, be curious about their development and register for those appropriate courses. So that was kind of the first pillar. The second pillar was very much specifically around future skills. Um, again, structured approach in terms of the personal skills, you know, the, those soft interpersonal skills such as presentation skills, negotiation skills, growth mindset skills, uh, th those types of areas. And then the other more technical ones were around data, digital, and then the fourth strand was sustainability as well. Um, so we really provided an array of, of uh, programs and training interventions around personal skills, data, digital, and sustainability. And then the other interesting thing that we did is that we are presently launching Talent Marketplace. And what I mean by that is that it's a, a, it's a, a massive glorified SharePoint, if you will, in terms of if uh, heads of businesses throughout the group actually want people to do very specific projects, then it's open for anybody within the bank to actually apply for those projects. 
It's not a specific change in their job, it's an add-on to their job, if you understand what I mean. And so therefore, again, it's giving individuals exposures into completely different projects from what their day-to-day -day job is. So I could be in Vancouver working on a strategic job that is actually happening in, in Shanghai, for example. So that exposure, that networking, again, was the third pillar that what we wanted to, to introduce, as well as critically looking at key roles and actually changing fundamental ways of undertaking those roles and giving them the appropriate skills and knowledge. And then lastly, basically the wider society piece in terms of sharing what we're doing, but as importantly, getting information and best practices from other organizations and institutions. So that's it. We've been a very, very structured in terms of how we've approached future skills. That's fantastic, Anthony. And I, I have a host of follow-up questions, but I, I don't want to, I know Lily does too, but I don't want to, to, to skip um, asking Lily the, the same question. So, so Lily, the same question to you. Why is reskilling, upskilling, future skilling of your current workforce so important to Cargill? Yeah, so uh, I think for, for Cargill, the practice is quite similar as which uh, Anthony just shared. We also like people to hold the ownership of their own de development and also like uh, to, to build this kind of like a network of learning uh, in, in whole Cargill. So, uh, but also I would like to talk from a strategy perspective, uh, if connect with our business strategy and also people's strategy. Okay, so as I just mentioned that uh, Cargill, <clears throat> if we are talking about the disruptions today, Cargill definitely need a, a transformation of our strategy from the commodity business to the specialty business. So we can like serve our customers, um, not only with like uh, only products, uh, which is with high quality and low cost, but also to help them to create this innovative and also uh, like a customized solutions, which support them to serve their customers better. So if that translates into our internal organizational capabilities, which means cargo from culture and also capability, we need to transfer from a operational excellence or operational efficient organization to a more innovative and also customer driven organization. So, so with this, like a, a strategy transformation, which means or the culture and the transfer uh, capability uh, uh, for, for the, for to achieve our future strategy also need to make a shift, right? So if we are talking about our people strategy, we are focused on like four pillars in addressing this. So first is our uh, people and customer, um, like a uh, uh, culture. So you will see that with the people, uh, people. Uh, focus and also the customer focus here actually like uh, come hand in hand with Kangol believes that with the, the great internal uh, employee experience so we can serve our customers better. So that's the first the culture we are uh, hoping to penetrating uh, this kind of like a customer focus mindset to everyone, not only to the commercial people, but also to uh, the operation people, the supporting functions as well. And uh, the second thing, uh, I think it's very like uh, uh, similar to to the HSBC is uh, doing right now. We are also focusing on the talents and also future strategic capabilities. So, so our business leaders clearly aware that a lot of like business decisions. For example, if we want to uh, like uh, uh, acquire a new company or, or or like innovate a new product. So without talents or without that capabilities in that industry, we are not able to make this kind of like a changes happen in the organization. So how to acquire these talents and capabilities or develop uh, turns to be uh, the priority uh, of uh, our, our organization. So, so far uh, we are uh, like, a, if we are talking a lot of our business leaders, so you will see uh, quite three competencies comes outstanding in their conversation. One is customer driven, strategic mindset and also bring outside in to be more innovative. So that's uh, the, 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 the three ones. And the last one is, uh, uh, which uh, I, I found is very like, uh, um, uh, I'm not sure unique or, or maybe quite common uh, in the industry is about the DEI, the diversity, equity and inclusion. So you will see that Cargill serves a quite like a diverse portfolio in the market. So we have like a different generation of customers, different like agenda, 
uh, and geographies. So, which means our leaders also need to be like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, have such like a diverse representation uh, to the market uh, as well. Yeah. So, this is overall like why uh, upscaling and rescaling is so important to us. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing, Lily. And yeah, I think some some differences and some real similarities between um, the approaches. Uh, four pillars seems to be the key. Um, <laughs> things 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 come in fours. Um, but yeah. jokes 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 aside, um, I do want to remind all of our attendees today that if you have any questions for Lily or Anthony. Um, and you want to put them into the chat or you have questions for each other that you want to ask in general, please also do dive into the chat, start putting those questions. I will call them out um, as and where appropriate as we move forwards. But while you guys are thinking of your questions, um, one of the questions that I would really like to ask, and I'll again, I'll pose this to both panelists, um, is really around, you know, there's this, this discussion and, and Anthony, you led off with that that first pillar about that shift from um, prescriptive, uh, almost spoon feeding, your manager tells you what you go on uh, to develop to this kind of much more self-led approach to career and growth. And, um, you know, that really vibes with our position on modern learning being, you know, modern learning being self-led, being proactive, being maybe blended, um, you know, the impact of virtual, a move to things like content curation and moderation rather than a traditional push um, learning and, and these ability to learn asynchronously, not always in a physical classroom. Uh, in fact, uh, I understand it's for most locations, a physical classroom is very difficult these days. So I'd like to, to, to ask, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with Anthony and then come to, to Lily secondly, but um, how important is this modern approach to learning uh, in meeting these, these challenges and these changes and this transformation that you're driving? It, it is absolutely crucial. It, it really is. And I think gone are the days where you used to have a, you know, a two-day program, a three-day program on, on some, some basic skills. Everybody needs those short, sharp interventions. And I think also that people are expecting um, to, for their learning, different learning styles to be addressed. Um, so, so utopia for us, and, and this is um, hopefully when we're back doing some face-to-face -face training, training, that we're, that giving, we're giving, giving, giving the, 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 the Delegate, delegate three, three choices. choices. Oh, one, Sorry, one moment. moment. Lily, Lily, could you, you move yeah, for a moment? We're getting, we're getting, getting a, a bit of feedback. feedback. Hello, yeah. Hello, yeah. Hello, so we're we giving, we giving. Oh, sorry. sorry. Lily. Lily. I'm unable, I'm unable to mute you, mute you, you but we're, but hearing, we're hearing our, our voices, voices back, back through, through your, your speaker. Lily, can you hear me? Is that better? Yeah, I can hear I'm, you now. I'm hearing no okay. echo now. Yeah. Yes, Perfect. great. So, so basic, basically, we're, we're actually giving our workforce three choices. And that is if they do want to do a face-to-face -face intervention, because that's their preferred learning style, and they see that actually meeting other people in the networking part is important to them. Or indeed, if it's more short, sharp virtual training that may basically may be lasting two hours, three hours, that's what they, they prefer doing and that matches their diary. Or indeed, if they want their own self-paced learning um, and again, having that, as, as what you said, that, that curation of content um, and have the ability to access that in, in say, very short, sharp, modular type of formats. So I, th I think, to be, to be honest, it's, it really is a case of giving our staff the choices of how they want to learn, when they want to learn, and what they want to learn as well. And I have to say again that over this last 12 to 18 months, under the banner of future skills, I think I've turned into more of a marketing expert than a natural training professional. Uh, because again, we need to be creating awareness of what we're doing and how we're doing it. And one of the, obviously the crucial ways of doing that is actually having, you know, really good uh, campaigns, you know, promotional videos, um, you know, you name it to actually get that awareness out there because people's day-to-day -day jobs are ultra, ultra busy. 
So how do we raise the awareness of what is on offer to them in order that they are taking care of their self-development and giving them choices? That's fantastic, Anthony. And um, we'll be moving on to a, another question just after I've got Lily's uh, feedback on this um, around really the new roles uh, in learning and development, because I think you've highlighted a couple there. You now have to be a marketer and uh, uh, a curator uh, rather than a sort of an administrator or a logistics specialist. So um, we'll get on to that in, in just a moment because you raised a fantastic point there. Um, yeah. Lily, for, for yourself and for, for Cargill, um, again, that question, how important is this modern approach to learning for you guys in, in meeting the challenges that you've, you've discussed previously? Yeah, so first I, I really wanted to like appreciate and also like echo what Anthony just shared because uh, he helped address some of the questions that I possibly have of the earlier uh, like uh, uh, topic. Um, and I think that in Kaguo, the uh, like the uh, awareness level or ownership level of our employees to to fully embrace um, like a digitalization learning or this modern way of learning is still on the journey. So people are start to get used to this with the pushing of pandemic. Okay, so 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 but we are putting a lot of efforts to uh, like uh, onboard uh, our managers uh, or also leaders to have better embrace of this modern way of learning. So far, we, we see a lot of like a great um, uh, like a progress. So, so I think um, uh, if we are talking from the leadership perspective, I think there are uh, two achievements. We, we definitely see the appreciate of the modern way of learning. The first thing is uh, the, 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 the digital way of communication helps to speed up the culture transformation and also internal communication. So earlier, if we are talking about like a transformation uh, in total, like a change leadership, it will happen in our uh, hierarchy, like uh, uh, organization. Uh, it will uh, from like a global leadership team and then regional leadership team that goes to our middle managers. It took around like weeks of time or maybe months of time to ensure that communication of the vision or the urgency is happening throughout the entire organization. But if you are looking at today, that we are leveraging a lot of this like a digital learning platform. So same as HSBC, we're also using degree. So there we have a lot of like a culture relevant or updates from the business. For example, nowadays we are uh, like driving this culture of customer driven. So, so the, 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 the customer like guiding principles or uh, like a learning, uh, like a, a education, uh, like a knowledge uh, a contents are all be like uh, internally curated and uh, like a design to put into this classroom. So all the communications could happen like over night time to ensure that reach like uh, uh, thousands or millions of people across the globe. So that's a very amazing thing which our leaders found. It's, it, 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 it happens in cargo, the efficiency of this like uh, learning platform. Uh, so, so, um, and also on the other hand, I think the leaders which appreciate uh, uh, the the incorporation of digital learning into uh, into uh, in, into part of uh, the culture is it helps to uh, to 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 really build a kind of like learning culture in our business. So earlier we say that only like R and D people or maybe like a, a talent development professionals are being involved uh, as uh, uh, like a learning agents or maybe uh, learning champions. But nowadays, anyone could be a like a knowledge owner or maybe actually uh, like a, a, a sharing person of any kind of like knowledge, right? So, so we are able to like communicate with some of our business leaders to like uh, 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 help them see like uh, uh, build a, a, a learning culture with the organization really helps to engage everybody to contribute their wisdom, their talents, their expertise into the learning. So uh, last month, we are launching a program to support a, a uh, like a global EHS team um, on their uh, like uh, leadership uh, transformation. So actually like we are uh, uh, like onboarding at least uh, like uh, uh, several leaders to take a facilitation role uh, on, on like uh, uh, throughout the journey. So they are learning resources from from the the degree platform they transfer that into like a, a like a, 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 a virtual sessions 
and then like support their team to make their reflection and discussion to conquer some like uh, um, uh, 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 common challenges. So that also helps to really like transform some like uh, outside not knowledges and make that uh, to to um, how to say internalize the external knowledge into like what we uh, the, the, the what makes like uh, the internal uh, clients feel relevant and value to help them solve the problems. Yeah. Absolutely, and thank you for sharing that, Lily. And it does bring to mind, um, you know, one one thing that that I'd I'd love to to bring up, um, which is you talk a lot about uh, leadership and 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 a change in the way leaders learn. And you know, for us, when we when we speak to a lot of organisations, there was a feeling pre-COVID that you know leadership was the one bastion of traditional classroom training. That if you wanted to do a leadership program, um, yeah. you know, that's where you take your folks offsite and you put them together in a room for five days or three days and and train them that way. But I know from our work with you guys that before COVID, we we'd started shifting that um, mindset on leadership and really taking a new approach to leadership um, training and development that was modern, that was asynchronous, that was self-led. So perhaps you could speak a little bit about that journey and transformation pre-COVID and then maybe even the impact of COVID um, on what you guys are doing in that space for upskilling leaders in leadership skills. Okay. So, so, so I, I maybe go first, uh, which Anthony can uh, add on. So, so for us, uh, I think the story is the same. So earlier we uh, do phase two, uh, before uh, pandemic, we did face-to-face -face workshops and people build connections. They are really talk to some person uh, which they know and discuss on the business challenges. So they feel everything is real, everything is kind of like a, also not that efficient or, or, or cost a lot of money, but still people make connections, right? So particularly for Cargill uh, or any kind of like a big organizations connections is kind of like a, a kind of like a currency or, or to smooth or categorize to, uh, to uh, uh, a catalyst to, to smooth your, your work in a big complex organization, right? So, so it also uh, uh, took time for us to really like uh, uh, educate or uh, shift the mindset of our leaders to make them see uh, the value of digital learning. So, but but this like a progress makes very like a slow before pandemic. But if we are talking during the pandemic, it particularly uh, by the end of the first year of, uh, of of pandemic, everything goes to change because it it seems like there is no opportunity at all in the organization to see each other in a short time, right? So 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 leaders are like the. Shift their willingness. They are somehow willing to try this first, right? So, so, so I think at that time we we also took a lot a lot of like efforts to try to understand each other, how to make this, um, like a digital learning to be also like a relevant and really could be like a, um, uh, efficient, uh, for for our leaders. So with um, like I, I think several things turns to be quite like a, a effective in our experiences is always like involved and also engage our leaders into the sessions to make them have this transparency and also visibility on what happened on, on, on people as they use it to have in the face-to-face -face sessions. So otherwise, the leaders will throw people into the digital learning and then say that, oh, you, you, you read articles, you, you watch videos, then you learn something. That's not happened overnight. So definitely there will be a, a entire organization, a lot of like a supporting environments to cultivate this culture happening in organization. So I think uh, for us, that's one biggest lesson to learn, which we found useful. Yeah. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing that, Lily, because I, I can I can hear a couple of things coming out, you know, the importance of network, social connection, right? These yeah. these types of modern learning interventions, you know, can't be isolated, right? You need to engage and build that network. And I love the, the, the term, you know, network is currency in an organization like Cargill. And I'm sure it is also in, in other large organizations, but even in smaller organizations, I would argue that <coughs> ne network is currency. So that social element being so important. Um, I also love that you highlighted uh, the relevance. And I, I think um, this is one of the things that, that we've certainly experienced is a scattershot approach 
doesn't work. It needs to be ruthlessly relevant to the, the, the people that we're trying to impact with these type of interventions, that they really need to, to know why, what's in it for me? You know, why am I doing this? Um, and the other thing that you mentioned was that, that kind of efficiency um, and that idea of, um, yes, it's relevant to me uh, in my role, in my future, in my growth, but it's also got to respect my time, right? It's got to, it's got to meet the needs uh, when and where I need it in an appropriate volume as well. So thanks so much for sharing that, Lily, and they're definitely trends that, that we're seeing. And Anthony, um, I would like to ask the same thing really around leadership as an sure. example, because it's that traditional, you know, off-site yeah. jolly has uh, been taken away from us. So um, maybe you could speak a little on that. Sure. I mean, I mean, obviously there's been a massive pendulum swing, as as you alluded to, Oliver. That that you know, two two three years ago, you know, two three day leadership face to face interventions were the were the, the the main focus, and then the pendulum swing completely the other way in terms of you know virtual learning or self learning. I am hoping that actually, as we come out of the pandemic, that there will be a pendulum balance. And what I mean by that is that we really think carefully outside the box <clears throat> in terms of true, effective, blended solutions. So where it makes sense to prepare individuals in gaining knowledge, um, you know, um, even gaining the, the skill a little bit in terms of virtual interventions and alternative delivery channels. But then when it comes to the embedding of that leadership skill or coaching skill or whatever it may be, then we are still bringing them back into a face-to-face -face intervention and really drilling down in terms of, of embedding and practicing that behavior and ensuring that that behavior actually changes in a very positive way. So I'm hoping that we get this pendulum balance rather than one extreme completely then to the, to the other extreme on, on the correct interventions. I, th I think just a, another another comment to make, and, and Lily alluded to it in the in the previous question, in terms of the importance of uh, business leaders getting involved in the delivery of training as well, um, whether it be knowledge or whether it be soft skills. I've always had the belief that the best formula of a really effective training intervention is to have a professional facilitator who knows their stuff, who's a subject matter expert, but also that business leader who has been there, done it, seen it, and got the experience. And to have that blended approach on a training intervention for delegates to, to actually be receiving that, yeah. I think is a, is a, a, good, a good formula. Because um, it actually, with that business leader getting involved, it brings the the academic, the theoretical concepts into life and how to actually practically use them. So I think that's just a, another point that I'd like to add. But I think the embedding piece still needs to come from a face-to-face -face piece. Interesting, though, and we've, we've talked a little bit about it, kind of bringing people together because of the networking. The constant feedback that we've got since we've done a, a majority of our trainings virtually is people do want to get together for that networking, and it's an important part of the learning process that actually people are put into a room and get to connect. Absolutely, Anthony, and I think that, again, that echoes that idea that, that any form of learning has to respect that sort of social element, right? People. People need the human um, in in their in their digital, if you will. Yeah. Um, I I have some questions coming in from the chat that perhaps we could. Sorry, Lily, did you want to ask a, a question to Anthony there? Oh no. So I think it's no, okay. Thank you. No, no problem. And do feel free, guys, to to dive in with questions. But we have some um, questions coming through, and um, I think one of the the questions here is is a great one from Neetha. Um, talking about and, and it makes me think about the sort of the pre-COVID world because I know Lily um, and Anthony both of you you know this shift towards doing things in a modern way and self-led and virtual and digital etc was not something that was triggered by COVID for either of your organizations this was a journey that you guys were already on long before that perhaps was accelerated by the COVID situation but um, 
so maybe maybe speaking about this um, from that perspective as well as the impact of uh, of COVID, uh, the question is: Has it been hard to shift a um, a conservative mindset of learning uh, within your organisations? If you had a conservative mindset towards learning, or, or people, employees did, or leaders did, um, was it uh, was it hard to shift the conservative mindset of learning within organisations generally? And how can we overcome that? Any tips that don't include a global pandemic? Um, let's go to Lily first, if I may. Yeah, I, I think uh, for, for us, because we are coming from quite traditional uh, like industry, so definitely like people are so used to, to their expertise and uh, uh, like a uh, way of working. So, uh, so, so the conservative kind of like uh, learners definitely is also part of our work in, in, in like a cope with. So for us, I think there is uh, definitely like um, uh, no shortcuts to 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 build this to say like we educate people through them some like a uh, uh, like a uh, uh, education or learnings then they their mindset will shift to like overnight. So uh, I would like to talk through this maybe from uh, from two perspectives. One is uh, from the learning itself, how we can influence these people, and also in other ways from the culture perspective, how to enable kind of like a real learning culture. So. Um, so a lot of times I think of, uh, from our leaders, they always like have the expectation people need to change and they must to change. It's not about like a, from good to, to better thing. It's a leave or die thing. So, so, so for them, this comes so natural and so, so, so without second sort kind of thing. So when they go to their uh, like uh, employees or team members, they always say that you need to join this training or you need to join that training. So people come to join uh, join trainings, but after that we find that also people like maybe participate in the training, but their heart was not with us for making progress of the learning. So then we realize that that for these people actually their willingness is not there. So if we are talking about really making like efficient that uh, like uh, not only about the skill part, it's also about your willingness, your attitude to learning, and also about like what you should do after that or what kind of like a supporting environment in, uh, like envir environment to help you remove the box so you have like uh, enough time and like concentrate like a uh, uh, mindset into the learning okay so 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 for us so whenever we uh, so, uh in, in part of my role i was like uh, uh, as like the rnd consultants a lot of times i access leaders to 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 check on their uh, 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 to to customize the learning. So one thing definitely I would check with them, like uh, how do you measure the willingness of the people's like uh, 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 learning to this learning? So so if it's so we need to face the truth, right? So if the willingness is low, how we can to to help them aware of that? So sometimes it's maybe like the people haven't aware the urgency or uh, aware the importance or some other things. So then that willingness education should also be built into part of the learning journey. So that's the one thing which we, we find. So another part, uh, part when we are talking about culture or supporting environment, so it's about like, um, it is about when people do, uh, so we, we have a, a survey to the participants to say like, uh, what stops you to uh, fully participate in the learning journey? And most common and most frequent uh, answer to that is always learning is not my priority. I have so many things occupied my, 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 my life that I don't have sufficient time to focus on learning, right? So, so, uh, so, so it, you, you, you will find out that if you don't learn, there is always thousands of like excuse, but if you have like, a, if, if you have the willingness to learn, you always have thousands of ways to conquer this one. Right, so so it is also about like how we working together with the participants and also the entire team within their together with their leaders and with their organization to address like uh, if we really wanted to invest in these people, what are the things we need to do to remove these blocks or to transfer these conditions so to for people to really focus and uh, and take and uh, get take away uh, from these learnings. So these are the things which we we additionally. I do with a standalone learning journey. One is willingness and then one is the supporting environment. Yeah. 
That's fantastic, Lily, and and certainly something that we see a lot, that, that willingness being crucial, but also that supporting environment. Uh, you made me think with with that comment of, you know, I'm too busy to learn being a common objection. Yeah. And I, I remember yeah. seeing a, a cartoon um, of, of folks pushing a cart up a hill with square wheels and somebody standing there with a drawing of a circular wheel. And they're saying, we're too busy. <laughs> we're too busy to learn. We're too busy to innovate. Um, we yeah. got too much work to do. Um, but but I really I really appreciate that because that definitely links with our findings around you know the relevance right seeing it yeah. as being very relevant and lighting that burning platform um, which I think in a way mm -hmm. links back to Anthony's earlier point about the roles of us as learning professionals you know as a as a marketer as a as a, a change agent is becoming even I'm not saying it wasn't important before but it's it's almost even more important uh, now. And so handing over to you, Anthony, um, you know, perhaps uh, same question, uh, moving from conservative traditional methods to modern methods and those challenges, but also maybe um, touch on some of those roles that you're, you're talking about as a, you know, as a, a learning leader, what you've had to adapt to. Sure, sure. Um, and, and again, you're quite right, Oliver. B before the pandemic, you know, we were focused on the content of curation and, and alternative delivery channels. And as we're going, say, probably 50 miles an hour at, uh, at meeting that, um, obviously when COVID came along, um, we had to go to like 150 miles an hour to, to, to do that. Um, so I think to, 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 to be honest, that, that unfortunately that, that COVID situation did help us get there a lot, lot quicker. I think looking back as well, it was interesting in terms of when obviously a lot of remote working and home working was, was, was happening, the concentration was definitely on is how is an organization going to operationalize and BAU in that new environment. So training, to be honest, wasn't a big priority, let, let's be honest. But actually when you take something away like that, then over the next kind of three months of, of really not supplying a lot of, of, of training, all of a sudden there's a thirst for it. And this is what we were finding. And as soon as we carefully looked at what are the types of training solutions do, 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 does everybody want now, it was things like, you know, mental health and well-being and, you know, exploring your career and, and kind of quite, dare I say, human positive things that people were really interested. And so therefore their thirst and eagerness to actually be registering and self-nominating for those programs because one, they hadn't received anything, you know, kind of over the last, you know, two months while, while transitioning into a um, remote working environment. And secondly, if you're kind of stuck at home for eight, nine hours a day doing emails and going on Zoom calls, et cetera, actually it's quite refreshing to go on a two, three hour, you know, virtual training intervention that is helping again, either you personally or your, your career development, et cetera. So I think it was, it was kind of a, a positive aspect of what we've been through in terms of this, this, this culture change and actually the quality of the training interventions. You know, we were producing very effective quality with virtual training. Um, and people, people really, really enjoyed that. Um, so I think it, it, it served its purpose of that culture change. And like I said, I do go back to my earlier comment of this pendulum swing from one extreme to another and trying to get this, this fine balance of when is it appropriate to do virtual training? When is it appropriate to do to do face to face training? Um, so yeah, yeah. And I think as, as kind of my my role, if I look back, has, has changed. It has, like I said, been that marketeer. It has been more of a, you know, campaigns and knowledge and awareness of, of what we do, we're doing. But also, I'm actually taking a lot out of one of our main programs in the Future Skills Suite, and that is data analytics, being data-driven and really carefully producing some proactive learning analytics that's telling me a story that is helping me make decisions of what I need to be doing over the next three months, six months, nine months. You know, when you're looking at penetration rates, when you're looking at, you know, uptake on training programs, when you, when you really are carefully reading into those analytics, 
what is working, what isn't working, where do we need to make the changes. So again, quite strategic in terms of interpretation of that, uh, the, the learning data analytics. I have, must admit I've got probably about half a dozen uh, bi-weekly dashboards that I'm examining to, to again help me inform of what is the best way forward and, and to support obviously the, the workforce, particularly around future skills. That's excellent, Anthony. And I think one of the uh, advantages of this this way of learning, um, and especially as you say, uh, if we're very deliberate about it and very careful about how we design, not not do it for the sake of it, um, that opportunity to capture perhaps a lot more data and and to design with data in mind is uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, one of the other things that you um, that you touched on was obviously, you know, people dealing with um, being in front of, you know, being on Zoom calls, being in front of the computer, being at home, being maybe a little bit isolated, and that that sometimes these virtual training sessions um, or training interventions that shift them out of the norm might um, might have a, a a big difference to their well-being and and break up their day a little bit. And that actually leads into one of the other questions we have from um, our audience today, uh, which came in from Cassie, who said. How do you think the concept of hybrid teams or people working remotely, and I can see Anthony is in the office today, although quite an empty office, Anthony, you look lonely there. Um, uh, how will that um, inform the overall impact and effectiveness of this transformation of future skills focused and modern learning? Do you think that modern learning will land better with particular populations or believe that it could be accepted across the board with learners at all levels of the organization? So who, who wants to field that one first? Sure, yeah, more than happy to, yeah. more than happy yeah. to, yeah. Um, I, I go back to the early point, I think we need to give individuals choices because we need to be quite specific in how uh, people have different preferences of, of their learning. So whether again, it be face-to-face, -face, hybrid or, or whatever. Uh, one of the interesting requests that uh, has been extremely popular, which I was, I was kind of, when I reflect back, I'm amazed at, is the amount of request for team dynamics and team offsites, virtual <laughs> offsites, virtual team dynamics. And, um, and, and again, I don't know whether, again, people feel the same, and, and Oliver, you're alluding to it in terms of, you know, working from home remotely, dealing with emails, you know, uh, um, you know, constantly, if I'm not dealing with the emails, then it's a very serious Zoom call. And I think the reason for the, for the demand of all of a sudden team dynamics is, is actually, you know, that, that softer side in terms of actually connection, that human connection with my colleagues. Um, and quite a, quite a number of the exercises that we've um, started with some of the team dynamics is really getting to know each other at a personal level to start off with. You know, you think of attrition rates and turnover rates, et cetera, you know, over an 18-month period, you know, you have got new members coming into a team, you know, who probably ne never met their colleagues face-to-face. -face. You know, how did he get to know them? And so this is when I look back as why we've actually had a lot of demand for, for kind of the team cohesion, the team dynamics, the, the virtual team, team off-sites. Also, I think with regards to uh, the question of hybrid working, it's obviously the way of the future, um, and different uh, teams, different functions within the bank are dealing with it in a slightly different of what works for them. But again, we've actually helped with that in terms of coming up with some really cool hybrid um, interventions for, for dealing with that. You know, how do you actually work better um, you know, as a, as a team when some may be in the office or some are actually working from home, etc. You know, how do you, how you have that virtual collaboration that is actually effective? So we've actually come up with some kind of quite, quite um, effective tools of team leaders having to deal in this, this hybrid situation. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of my uh, thought process and when I reflect back as well. Really appreciate that. Appreciate that, Anthony. Lily, do you have anything to add? I'm very conscious of our time where this is probably yeah. the last uh, question that we'll be able to answer. Yeah, so I definitely very echo with what Anthony just shared because in Chicago, we also like observe this a similar kind of like uh, uh, symptom 
uh, that a lot of requests about like uh, uh, team synergy, team dynamic, understanding each other, how to build the trust, how to build the relationship with our stakeholders comes to our uh, like a requested list too. So, so which we see that uh, so while we are like uh, the, the entire working force trends is to be like a hybrid, but still people like uh, we are human beings, we expecting to see each other, know each other, that helps to build the relating and the empathetic and also uh, like a relationship uh, with the organization. So eventually, uh, so we find that if we are comparing with two uh, like a teams in our organization, so one one team was like uh, after of transformation never see each other, but for the other team, uh, which they uh, like uh, maybe got chance to meet with each other, the kind of like ownership and also alignment would be a little bit like a different compared with, uh, with these two groups. So, so I would say that if in, in summary, that the hybrid would only happens effectively uh, only as you, uh, as a, like a team who really like are really caring about each other's growth as a team and who really like uh, challenging each other in the work. So both high on caring and challenging, we are able to have a, like a grown culture, growing culture, then as senior members, we are, can be like effectively in this kind of like a hybrid workforce situation. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Lily. And I think that this is one of the, the core um, immediate sort of skills and challenges. And I, I think both of you alluded to sort of the challenges of leading teams in yeah. this this hybrid environment and unfortunately time flies when we're having fun um i i honestly could continue this conversation for an awful lot longer and feel like we're learning so much but we don't have uh, any more time for questions but what i will do just briefly is you know a couple of the key takeaways that that i've received from our conversation that that really stand out to me is that that it it seems like this shift to um, this new way of learning was happening before COVID, but really COVID has been an accelerant. Um, I love the 50 miles an hour to, I don't know, are we past the speed of sound now, Anthony, or are we at light speed with this type <laughs> of transformation? Or have we teleported ahead? But um, the, that some of the key takeaways, right? Willingness, um, that relevance, making it so relevant for our learners what, they're, what they are learning. Um, I, uh, the other takeaway that I'm getting is, is social, human interaction. If we're leveraging modern learning, if we're leveraging hybrid working, we need to keep the human in it. We can't just go, here's technology and, and leave it out there. Um, respecting time, time of our learners, uh, giving them the space, the, the possibility uh, to do this, and, and really pulling them through those roles that Anthony mentioned of um, you know, being a marketer, right? Be running campaigns, looking at the da data analytics on our programs. And, and so in a way, it feels like uh, we really need to start with ourselves as learning professionals in that learning agility, learning new skills, uh, learning a new direction and a new way of working. Um, and, and I really appreciate both of your time today. Lily, thank you so much. And Anthony, thank you so much for joining me. I hope that this has been uh, interesting for both of you, as well as for our attendees who have joined us today. And the recording will be available on demand on our website. If any of our attendees have any further questions or things that you would like to clarify or get more information on, um, I've dropped my email address into the chat so you can reach out to me and we'd be happy to continue the conversation. So once again, Thank you both, Lily and Anthony, for joining me today. This has been a fantastic learning session for, for me and uh, for our attendees as well. So thank you for your time and uh, really looking forward to having you on another panel in the future. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, guys. Bye -bye. And everybody have a great rest of your week. This webinar is brought to you by GP Strategies. Together we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can access more webinars or download additional resources at gpstrategies.com forward slash resource hyphen library.